is the Jeff Santos Show. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show making our way home here. Again, folks, for those listening on AM 1530 uh, WVBF, uh, Middleborough Taunton, this is Election Day in Massachusetts, so you have until 8 o'clock tonight to vote in the Senate race and congressional races and obviously uh, other races as well. And um, we urge you to go out and vote. We'll be uh, giving you a perspective tomorrow on uh, on all of this and what it means, both locally and nationally, obviously with the name Kennedy on the ballot uh, and, of course, what the stake is and with the House Ways and Means chairman in the Congress, and particularly when the Democrats are now in the majority, what that would mean, and, of course, uh, what Senator Markey has uh, done. So all that will be uh, topics tomorrow for uh, a lot of analysis, and we'll be bringing it to you here on the Jeff Santos Show. But don't forget to vote till 8 o'clock tonight. We go west, young man, and we find a great young man who's a renaissance man. He is uh, a great journalist, Democracy Watch News. He is a great musician. He plays his guitar. He is also a great singer. He is Mark Taylor Canfield. How are you, sir? Happy Tuesday. Hey, Jeff. I'm doing okay. I was just uh, talking to Ron, your producer, and he said, hey, how about getting a job with the Seattle Police Department? Because you can make $414,000 a year, which is more than the United States president makes. So that sounds like a good gig if you can get it. But also, I saw your you tweet, know. sir. I saw your tweet, and I am retweeting it as uh, we speak here. Look, uh, this to me is an example of the warped ideas of what has happened in Seattle. I presume what we see here is a scenario where there is some overtime involved, uh, but not 400000 So I, I, where is this coming from? I mean, are they, are they paying this person? This is a police officer. We're not talking about the commissioner of police. I don't know what the wage is, but I mean, it's, this to me is, is out of control, but so on most police forces in this country, and tragically enough. Well, in the meantime, I mean, not to say that there needs to be any defunding of the police departments. Because, no, that's my gosh, not where we're I mean, going. You know, no, no. $400,000 is just great. So compare that to what we pay nurses, teachers. So then we have cops who are now building concrete walls. They already built one around the West Precinct station in downtown Seattle. Now they built a concrete uh, wall around the East Precinct, which was the whole focus of the CHOP autonomous zone there for a long time was the East Precinct. Well, now, you know, it's had a fence around it for a long time, a metal fence. Now they brought in the concrete barrier. So it looks like they were expecting some kind of war. I don't know. This looks like British police stations, you know, in Northern Ireland or something. Meanwhile, the protesters' demands have not been met. The city council did not cut the budget as much as they wanted. They are getting a resignation of uh, Chief Best, Chief Carmen Best, but the mayor is still hanging in there, and the rest of the protest demands haven't been met either, which is one of them being that the, all the protesters have their charges dropped. Now, Pete Holmes, the city attorney, says that he probably will drop all of the charges against protesters who have been involved in you know, nonviolent protests or whatever. So police are now, unfortunately, just breaking windows of cars and pulling people out to arrest them. The Kenosha cops did that to the riot kitchen staff from Seattle who have been providing food to the protesters in both cities and in Portland. But the police reported, quote, suspicious activity by cars with out-of-state license plates, unquote. So they ended up busting the windows and pulling them out. I watched Seattle police do it to a car escorting marchers outside of the Washington State Patrol headquarters here in Seattle. Um, They broke out the windows of this car and just pulled the driver out. So that's really scary. And then, unfortunately, we have this Patriot prayer guy in Portland who was shot and killed during protesters on Saturday. So Trump, of course, is encouraging the violence and calling the mayors of Portland and Seattle radical left Democrats and trying to stir it up for his own personal political reasons, which is just asinine and offensive. But that's the situation. I think Robert Craig earlier summed it up just perfectly when he talked about what happened in Kenosha. Anybody who thinks that the Republicans are somehow revolutionary instead of the reactionaries that they are has been completely fooled by this big million-dollar show called a convention. And 
And man, I just hope that the guy who was the son of a, of a rich guy learns someday how to be a responsible community partner, which is what you would also expect from the police departments around the country. But I know that being a, a billionaire and being a, a rich man's son means never having to say you're sorry. So that's just where he's at. Yeah. And well, I mean, there's also because... a lot of nar- narcissism. There's also a lot of the mean streak. I mean, this guy doesn't care about anybody but himself. And it's and it's obviously quite apparent. I'm wondering, though, in terms of what is happening with with the Seattle police, um, is there any any idea of who they're going to replace Miss Bess with or have they made a replacement? No, she's uh, actually just now going into an official resignation. So the deputy chief has been covering as acting police chief. And no, I don't know what's going to happen with that, Jeff. It's uh, it's definitely going to be a major issue. I mean, appointing a new chief of police during this era is going to be very political. You know that the Police Officers Guild is going to want to get involved in that debate and politicize it probably as well, which is another problem we're having with police departments around the country is that they're getting directly involved with politics by telling people who to vote for and against. That's what the the president of the Seattle Police Guild was telling people to vote against the city council members, you know. And so it'll be a huge debate and a huge argument. But given all of the things that the Seattle City Council has dealt with this year, I mean, why not? Why not another big, huge political turmoil in Seattle? Because that's the way the whole year has been. So why would this be any different, right? But the protests continue every single day, every single day, twice a day at least. And um, things are not calming down in Portland. Things are, There are more confrontations going on down there, actually. But here in Seattle, the protests continue, and every once in a while the police decide to crack down on them and just sort of arrest a bunch of people almost seemingly randomly. And then the city attorney says, well, you know, I'm, I don't agree with what the police are doing. So I'm not going to prosecute a lot of those people. So you have this strange disconnect uh, in the city where the police department have one philosophy, the city attorney has another, and then you sort of have a mayor who looks like she is sort of trying to stand on the sidelines, but in the end is going to be seen as basically protecting the police department because she vetoed the uh, city council's proposal to cut 100 jobs from the Seattle Police Department. That's the mayor using her executive power right there, where she's just taking a stand and saying, I individually, as they say in that that British uh, sitcom, uh, Are You Being Served? I am unanimous in that. (laughs) Yes, that is a great one. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Are you being... (laughs) Boy, that's... She's become quite a... This progressive that ran on on giving people housing and and being the kind face of, of politics... Just turned out to be, she's quite a law and order person. She's quite, she kind of just likes to be powerful and push her weight around. And that's, I guess that's typical for some neoliberals. You know, she has a sense of entitlement, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it doesn't go over well with the protesters. They're just kind of done with Jenny Durkin. I mean, you know, she's, as far as I'm concerned, she's a political lame duck. But, um, I don't think too many people are going to want to vote for her again. And she is up for re-election next year, so. Well, let me ask you, because I, did, I just realized this. Uh, I didn't realize this. I, I, I knew it was the case. But what is happening on the statewide side? Because you guys have a governor's race uh, in November as well, right? Yes. And it depends on who you talk to, but I don't see a strong challenger from the Republican Party. There was talk that um, Mr. Eyman, the guy that runs all the, the right-wing uh, initiatives or against the progressive initiatives, by the way, the initiative that Seattle passed to further regulate assault weapons was upheld by the Supreme Court. So that's breaking news also. As far as I can tell, there's no serious Republican challenger, but it's a strange year. So nothing is normal. As far as I can tell, Jay Inslee is relatively popular because he just hasn't been seen as somebody who either got really heavy handed, although the Washington State Patrol was involved with, you know, cracking down on some protesters. But basically what happened is, is there was a primary, right? And he sailed through. He's looking pretty strong. He led the primary election with 52% of the vote. And then the Republican police chief, Lauren Culp, was running a distant second. So not a strong challenger at this point. Lauren Culp has advanced to face Governor Jay Inslee in the 
general election. Our Republican challengers on the east side, especially, who would like to take back the state legislature and go back to the days of where nothing happens because the Republicans were just very obstructionist in Washington state. They also gave us this really silly law that says that can be no city individually that can pass rent control in Washington state, which is, I mean, to me, first of all, that's a, that's a conflict of interest between state authority and, and municipal authority. I mean, why would the city be obligated by state law? You know, of course, the real estate developers would be against it. I'm sure Jeff Bezos and the libertarians would be against it, but rents are so high in Seattle and have gone up astronomically. So there's no way to justify not having some kind of rent control in Seattle unless you just don't believe in rent control at all, which some people are, would say that. There, there have been some debates in Seattle. We've talked before about how Bernie Sanders came to Seattle to talk about rent control years ago when he was mayor of Burlington, Vermont, and said that housing was a human right. And that was a radical idea at the time, but our city council member, Judy Nicastro, picked up that cause and tried to bring rent control to Seattle, but uh, it just never happened. The real estate developers usually, Jeff, are able to block things like that by bankrolling and supporting a mayor, mayoral candidate, even yeah. a very progressive mayoral candidate who, once they get into office, because they've been given so much money by the real estate developers and the other large corporations, tend to side with business after that, and especially with real estate developers, because that's where all the billion-dollar projects are happening in Seattle. They're all high, high-rise towers mostly corporate headquarters um, going up in Seattle, all from Lake Union all the way to downtown, to the middle of downtown Seattle on Elliott Bay. It's just one big, huge development. And it's been that way for the last two years. Everything slowed down, of course, and the construction workers went on leave. So there were months there where no construction was happening, but the cranes were still there, and they've now started rebuilding. So all of those projects are in progress. Let me ask you, uh, is, is there a scenario where, you know, even though there's 42 million people unemployed, I mean, how has this affected people who are unemployed looking for a home or an apartment? I mean, if you're paying $2,000 a month for a one bedroom, as an example, in some parts of the city, you don't have any money. I don't see how you pull that off. You know, there's no help from the federal government. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe Bezos is going to pay everybody to work for Amazon. But I, I'm wondering, what, what is the status right now? Well, I just saw a news report, which I'm trying to look up right now, about the, the unemployment claims in Washington State, which are just outrageously high. And so, yeah, there are a lot of people who do not have employment right now and are struggling. And so the D Department of uh, Employment, Employment Security Department is what it's called in Washington State, is really overwhelmed with claims and are having a really hard time keeping up with what's going on here. And at the same time, you know, there are some people who are starting to say, you know, maybe, hey, maybe it's time to go into phase three. And that's what the Assistant Secretary of Health was saying that the data supports reopening Washington schools and businesses. But I think that given what I know about um, Governor Inslee, I think he's going to be super cautious about that. And most of the Democrats are. So the slow progression back to economic stability, and we've talked about this too, the entertainment industry has really suffered. The, the service industry folks have really suffered. People who don't have backup who didn't you know make enough because they're making minimum wage or less to to have a savings to fall back on some of them have been able to file for city county and state grants of small businesses some of them have been able to do that and have been eligible others have just laid off a lot of workers and it it's sort of back to depression era style living where people are either homeless so they're living in tents or they're sharing houses where people are paying literally like uh, $600 for a room in a house per month. And that's cheap. That's considered really cheap. Right. And that's just a room where you sleep and then the rest of the house, you know, you have to share with everyone else. And, um, and then, you know, you do have high wage earners who were able to kind of sit out the downturn and just... Basically, I think a lot of people stopped consuming a lot and stopped
stopped spending a lot of money. So those people sat on whatever they had earned and and um, sat through it. They're getting work again. Things are slowly work, um, opening up again. Then you have a lot of folks who were poor to begin with. I just think everybody has suffered in terms of the limit limits placed on mass transit, you know, for people who relied on that to get to work or to get around. Just you guys, uh, just to just to interrupt a second, uh, Mark, how, sure. how much rail do you now have? Because I know that for a long, long time you've been looking to get more and more rail, and I think you have some. Um, but, I mean, are people taking it during this pandemic? As far as I can tell, and I've heard several reports on this recently, um, but I would, you know, urge everyone in Seattle to verify it, is I haven't heard of any reports linked to using mass transit in the city. And I think partly because... It is very, it's been very limited use, limited schedules, even the ferries uh, back and forth to Bainbridge Island. Now, we went on the uh, Virginia 5, that historic steamship, to Bainbridge Island again, and there were very few people, very few passengers. It was very limited. Everybody had to wear a mask. Most of the decks were outdoor decks, so that's where people spent their time. I played some music and performed for people, and they were very appreciative, but everybody is is still kind of in a very chill mode where nobody wants to be in large crowds together. So that has really affected the tourism industry. Although, you know, the, the bars on Bainbridge Island and those great restaurants over there where you can get fresh seafood and fresh chowder like nowhere else in the country, they're still happening. And the and they actually have been lucky not to ha- um, have health issues with their employees. So people have just been very careful. They also have outdoor seating, you know, and it's summer. So people are able to go outdoors. And, yeah, I think uh, we, we're we getting by somehow, and we're still able to function, but there's a lot of um, slow economic growth rather than the huge boom, the incredible billion-dollar gold rush, IT gold rush style thing that did surpass the Yukon gold rush in terms of the amount of money and growth. It really was going through the roof, and yet still people were struggling to provide basic services because there was this battle against any corporate taxes. And that's the battle you have, you know, where the the mayor and the business interests want to keep taxes low and attract large corporations to come and set their headquarters up in Seattle, which is, you know, no. How many many more headquarters do you need? I mean, you got Microsoft, yeah. you got Amazon, you got Starbucks. What else? I mean, do they want to have uh, like have twenty five of them and, and destroy every small Google too? Do you want to destroy uh-huh. every small business in the entire city? Is that the is that the aim, Ms. Durkin? <laughs> well, the, you know what it is is that there's a certain part of Seattle that has now become the new business business district, and it's a completely newly re- redeveloped area. Um, between South Union and Westlake and downtown and 4th Avenue and, you know, Westlake Park where all the famous Occupy protests and recent protests have taken place. All that area is the new business district. So it's all brand new buildings. They've all been built within the last couple of years. And it's where Amazon headquarters is at. It's where Google is at. You know, of course, I, REI has always been here, and that's in that neighborhood as well. Although I have to admit, you know, going to their building is like going to a national park because it's surrounded by trees and it's kind of nice. Enough. But the rest of those buildings, they're all pretty much office buildings. People don't live in them. They just work in them, and then they go home at night. And they, a lot of them leave the city or go to the east side, uh, the wealthy suburbs or wherever where they live. Um, but then they come back into town. So at night you can hear a pin drop, and there's not much entertainment going on, of course, these days. There's a few good rock clubs around there. But that whole area is the... It's kind of the new downtown in a way, um, but a much more upgraded, upscaled, uh, more northwest kind of style, glass towers. It's very corporate. But then at night, like I said, most of those people go home. So the only people you're going to see in those buildings are either people working late and overtime, which are a few, or you know, security guards or whatever, you know, people who have to be there, custodial people. Otherwise, it's quiet. And it's not like a big city. It's really hard to explain. But it's changed the entire face of Seattle. And my point has always been that Amazon at the famous Sears, which is just is in that area, they brag in their public presentation that they that they did not just develop a part of Seattle, they developed the city. 
that they were, <laughs> were redesigning the yeah. entire city, and they're very proud of that. But it's not just Amazon. It's Google, too. They just bought the uh, the lot where the biggest guitar shop north of, of L.A., the guitar center of them all, the king of the guitar centers, where like, they had like $3 million worth of guitar and music in inventory that got torn down to put up a google tower you know for the show box and other places that are trying to survive that they can continue uh we lost a restaurant here in boston uh called fours and uh named after bobby orr and a few other athletes who wore number four and i um i just hope that this is not a continuation because of the pandemic and because of the amazons of the world keep on fighting my friend uh, find out more uh, at Democracy Watch News. And where else, Mr. Mark? At my YouTube channel, Mark Taylor Canfield at YouTube, and then Facebook and Twitter. I'm all over the place. SoundCloud has some of my music now. So talk to you next week. Keep up the good work, you guys. Hey, thank you so much, Mark. Mark Taylor Canfield right here every Tuesday on the Jeff Santos Show. He is a renaissance man. Hey, I want to thank uh, our good friend uh, Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast today. And again, folks, um, there is a election going on in Massachusetts. Get out there and vote. Every vote counts until 8 o'clock Eastern time tonight. We will do uh, an extensive uh, at least hour on tomorrow on this uh, very much the state and what the implications are of who wins and uh, who doesn't win and it i think will have some national implications for those of you who live outside the commonwealth uh and that to me is uh you know why we're going to try to uh tell you all just about it so keep on fighting right now my name is jeff santos and it is my time to say i gotta go